Thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction. And thank you, everyone, for coming out this evening. I hope it's not too hot. Um, <laughs> and it's great to meet you all. Tonight's talk is about meditation, which, of course, often is called mindfulness these days. I'm also going to talk about the theme of happiness and the idea of developing compassion. So my um, story with meditation started 26 years ago through profound unhappiness and uh, very um, dangerous levels of stress. That's basically what drove me to a monastery. Uh, before I became a Buddhist monk, I had no interest at all in Buddhism or any kind of spirituality. But what happened was a very uh, dangerous burnout at age 21. I was living in New York, and I was living um, a very extreme lifestyle. I wasn't looking after my health. I was going to parties all the time. I was uh, drinking too much. I was smoking. I was really um, unhealthy in my lifestyle, but mainly also in my mind. I was completely unable to um, understand my own emotions. I was having panic attacks quite regularly, and these built up like a crescendo and developed into what was almost like a heart attack. So I, it was very dramatic. I woke up one morning unable to move, and my heart was jumping out of my body. I went from doctor to doctor, and they said, you have atrial fibrillation. Then another doctor said, you have a, a slight piece missing in your heart that's made you weak uh, and susceptible to stress. Um, other doctors said you just need to um, slow down <laughs> and you just need to um, learn how to deal with your mind. So I was in bed for about four, four or five months, very, very ill. And it was during that time that I started to read books about meditation. Uh, my mother was looking after me. She also lived in the States at the time. And she gave me these books about meditation, which I started to devour. And I started to really... Um, get quite turned on to this idea that uh, your mind is something you can train and develop and uh, you don't have to suffer, you don't have to... The way you think you are now is not your ultimate nature. These are the clouds, these are the weather, there is the sky behind that, there's something deeper. So this idea started to really obsess me and then at that time, you know how everything just comes together at the right time, an old school friend of mine told me about a Buddhist monastery where you can go for a year to be a monk. And this idea com felt completely outrageous, but somehow right. So I went with my friend to this monastery. We both enrolled. She became a nun. I became a monk with the plan to just stay a year. In fact, I arrived, and after four days, I was in the robes with a shaved head, and sort of blinking in the sunlight, saying, what, what have I done? And, <laughs> and I remember I just was sort of not sure what to do with myself, but I went to um, a friend and I said, well, well, how do you meditate? Because in those days, Sami Ling, which is the monastery um, I belonged to, was very experimental. Nowadays, it's much more strict and, and disciplined, but in those days, it was very experimental in that it opened its doors to lots of young people quite wild, with wild energy, and just opened themselves up and said, come here and we'll help you, and you kind of find your own way. So I remember wandering into the, into the meditation room after having been a monk for a few weeks, and I thought maybe I should actually learn meditation, and I said to a friend, okay, so how do you do this thing? And she said, well, you just sit there. <laughs> so I just sat there like a sack of potatoes and just wasn't sure what to do. And then I went to one of the group meditation sessions. It was two hours long. And you couldn't move because you're in public and you're a monk. You're supposed to look all kind of, you know, serene and posh and all of that. And they're all looking at you and you're sitting there thinking, what do I do, what do I do, How do, what do I do, what do I do? And then slowly over time I started to get teachings and instructions. It was very good for me to be thrown into the deep end and then find my way. And slowly I started to trust the teachers. Akong Rinpoche, who is my teacher, who um, was in charge of the monastery at that time, really took me under his wing and started to gradually teach me the stages of uh, meditation training, which got me really into it. I mean, I really started to think of staying longer than a year, and that's, of course, what happened. In my second year of being a monk, I went into... Uh, well, I decided to you know, try another year, and I went into a uh, nine-month-long solitary retreat, 
Um, and do, everyone thought I was crazy, and I would go crazy, but I tried it, and it seemed to help, because during those nine months, uh, I started to study and meditate on the notion of compassion. And I'm not saying it made me into a suddenly compassionate person, but it made me ask questions. It made me start to ask questions, what, what, are, what are we here for? What are, we, what are we doing on this planet? What am I, what's my role? What could I do? And I started to realize that if I stayed a monk and learned more about the mind, I might be able to help other people with their minds, particularly because I'd had such a struggle myself with very severe anxiety disorder and depression. I thought, well, maybe I can work through this and, and then show and help others to do the same. I didn't imagine myself going around giving lectures or writing books or anything like that. I just thought in a simple way, maybe I can be of benefit. And so after that retreat, I decided to take the vows to be a monk for my whole life. And that was 26 years ago. Here I am. And what happened was my monastery asked me to start um, giving classes and giving courses. And this was way be before the sort of big trend in mindfulness. So I was a little bit adventurous. I went into prisons and hospitals and drug rehab centers and just started giving classes, and people seemed to benefit. Um, and my own practice was starting to grow. I mean, I was learning while teaching. I still, still am learning. And then I worked like that for about uh, 12 years and then decided to go again into retreat through the advice of my teacher and through my own uh, inclination. And that's when I did that more extreme retreat that you heard about in the introduction, the four-year-long four retreat. In Tibetan Buddhism, there's a very traditional retreat that lasts for three years, three months, and three days. But in my monastery, we follow two lineages of Buddhism, so putting them together, we have a four-year retreat. Uh, so it was four years on a remote Scottish island, with 20 other monks, you can't speak to each other much. And in fact, in the second year, you take a vow of total silence for five months. And the main thing about the retreat is that you really are in retreat. I mean, you have no uh, contact with the outside world at all. There's no, we didn't even have electricity. We had a generator that uh, came on uh, at night so we could see our way around, but basically there was nothing, no, no contact with the outside, and very, very intensive, um, meditating all day. It was probably the most unhappy period of my entire life, because what happened to me was all of that panic and anxiety came back full force. Uh, I'd sort of suppressed it for 12 years, and now I'm standing in a corner backed into the corner with my own mind, and it was horrible. I started to have panic attacks again, and I started to oscillate between very extreme panic and very, very, very deep depression, and I felt like a complete failure because I, I'd been a monk for 12 years, and now I'm in this sort of so-called advanced retreat and supposed to be, I don't know, levitating or whatever, and <laughs> actually I'm just crying. Um, so the first two years of that retreat, the first half was... Uh, extremely painful. Um, but what happened during the, the retreat was I had another meltdown. These meltdowns are quite good for you, actually, because what, what happened to me was I completely broke down in the middle of the retreat and got to the stage where I thought, I'm going to have to leave, or if I stay, I'm going to have to somehow resolve this. And so through enormously uh, strong help from my retreat master, Lama Yeshi, I managed to stay and managed to learn how to give compassion to that part of my mind that was so tormented. And there was a kind of energetic shift in that the revulsion and, 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 and the um, uh, horror towards myself started to change into acceptance. I was using the meditation now in a much more effective way. I think I'd used meditation to run away from myself before. And I know many people do that, and I can understand why. But it doesn't, it doesn't work. At some point, you catch up with yourself, and that, that's what happened. So I started to see how the meditation practice could help me to uh, engage compassionately with this 
part of myself that I'd always found repulsive and always wanted to get rid of. And so the second half of the retreat was very different. I, I really started to get into it, and I started to um, really discover how you can train in happiness as a skill. It's a skill of the mind. And for me, I'm not saying it's like this for everybody, but for me it was very much about learning to engage with the parts of yourself you don't like, the fear, the anxiety, the horror, and you, uh, using a, uh, uh, meeting that in a loving way, happiness starts to grow because the resistance drops away. So when I came out of that retreat in 2009, I came to London and really noticed how unhappy people seemed. Um, not in a sort of judgy way, I wasn't going around saying that everyone's miserable, but I just was sort of getting into working again, teaching, talking to people, and I started to just see how people uh, have become more impatient with their own feelings. And of course, technology has a big part to play in that. When I came out of retreat, everybody's face was uh, glued to an iPhone. That uh, smartphone revolution happened during those four years, and also all the social media networks were invented during that time. So I came out to a very different landscape. And one of the things I noticed most strongly was that people are feeling, um, well, invaded by information all the time. We, we used to have a different relationship with information. We could, we could go towards the information. Now it comes to us. And so the news feeds are, are basically stoking everyone's cortisol levels and making people more anxious. Oh, and then I noticed that when you get on a train now, the first thing they say is, if you see a suspicious, if you see something suspicious, phone this number. So as soon as you arrive somewhere, you're immediately told all the things that are going to horrible things that are going to happen. Um, and then we also have this huge rise in in. Um, political movements that use fear to win votes. We all know what that is about. And so there's a huge level of anxiety in our culture now that I don't think has ever been so strong before. And so that, of course, made me much more um, uh, committed to my work, which is all about teaching mindfulness to people, very much outside of a religious environment. I'm not interested in converting people to Buddhism or anything like that. I'm interested in helping schools and colleges and businesses and all kinds of people from all walks of life learn to practice uh, meditation techniques. But one thing I noticed really strongly when I started to teach people again was that they, their impatience became a problem in the meditation training. In that they, people meditate and then are waiting for something to happen immediately. And, and that's worse than it's ever been. Um, it's very interesting how when somebody decides to learn meditation, they make this shift from external to internal, in that they make that decision that happiness is really a mind state, it's a, a state of being, it's something within... So if we meditate, we're learning to stop grabbing onto the happiness around us and, and instead finding it within. That's a very interesting shift. But what then happens is the person starts to look for happiness in the meditation. We didn't find it outside, so now let's find it inside. So we start to look for it in the meditation. And then we get more unhappy because we're grabbing onto a feeling all the time. And I think this is another thing that's uh, been exacerbated uh, by our use of technology, is that nowadays we're very obsessed with um, instant feelings. We want to have our senses stimulated constantly. That's how the TV programs we watch manipulate our senses. The movies, the, the social media that we scroll through, it's very much about um, exciting the senses. And we've got into a state where we think something... Uh, it, is only working if we feel something from it. We have to feel something all the time. So then, of course, people learn meditation and they try and feel something in their meditation. L let me tell you my own story with this, uh, is that when I first became a monk, I definitely got into that, in that I was meditating and 
actually getting more unhappy the more meditation I did. I remember in the first year of being a monk, I would do a lot of meditation. I really got into it, and I would do it all through the day. I would, I would be working in the monastery, but then I'd keep sitting down and med meditating throughout the day. And I started to go around with this kind of sinking feeling in my heart. It's almost as if the more meditation I did, the more miserable I became, and the more let down I started to feel. And I went to my teacher, and he said, well, it seems to me that you're meditating like a drug addict. And this was quite a shocking thing to hear, but it, it really rang true because I realized that what I'd been doing was sitting down to meditate and then thinking, okay, I've done 10 minutes. When am I going to get, get a buzz? When am I going to get a hit from this? When am I going to come up on my meditation? <laughs> because that's all I'd known in terms of happiness little hits of pleasure. So I assumed now meditation should give me a little hit of pleasure. And the problem is, the more you're looking for that hit of pleasure, the more you are creating the absence of pleasure. Because the, the mind that thinks I want to be happy is the mind that thinks I am not happy. The more I want to feel happy, the more I'm telling myself I lack that feeling. And because everything in our mentality is a habit that perpetuates more of its own nature, that just grows. The more I want happiness, the more I'm building a feeling of lack. Of course, this is a, a part of human psychology that advertisers know how to manipulate. They always make us feel there's something else out there, we'll never truly be happy. And of course, that's become more and more prevalent now because of the nature of how we're invaded by constant advertising on our phones. So I think more than ever, we're in that state of wanting to feel something all the time. And I meet many people who meditate and they say, well, it didn't make them feel good. They didn't get anything from it. So what changed for me uh, was when I um, learned how to not do that in the meditation. I learned how to link the meditation practice with two major things. One is acceptance, and the other one is compassion. So, and I'm still learning, of course, but what was a shift for me was learning how to meditate without, well, meditate badly, basically. Just think, I'm just gonna do it, it doesn't matter. I'm, I'm, I don't need to do it well, I'm just gonna do it. That's what I call, I mean, meditate badly. What I mean is, don't put too much pressure on yourself for it to go well, just do it. And what also, what also I found very transformative is learning to meditate when I felt ill or when I felt unhappy. And of course, this was a major thing for me in the four-year retreat as well, is learning to be with discomfort in a, in a meditative way because then you're not always striving for a good feeling, you're just learning to be with the moment, whatever that is. So I think that's a very important thing to explain and promote in the world of meditation and mindfulness because many people tend to, uh, be crave, tend to crave that uh, sensation of well-being, which means they're maybe just creating the absence of well-being. So this is the question, what, what is happiness? If we're making this shift from okay, it doesn't come from outside, it's a state of mind, you know, the famous phrase, happiness comes from within. But what is it? What does that mean? So if it's not about having a great feeling, what is it? Well, I think it's very much about being less tormented by our thoughts. I think happiness is the same as freedom. Being free from having a... Um, tempestuous relationship with our own mind. So then another problem arises. If you say that to people, they say, oh, okay, so meditation means clearing the mind. So let's get rid of all those thoughts. Let's just sort of vacuum them up and, and throw, throw them away. And that's another problem which comes up a lot in meditation, is people try to do it in a very sort of mind-clearing way, where they sit down and just try and blank out their thoughts. And then it's enormously frustrating because the more you try to still your thoughts, the louder they shout. The more you push something away, the more uh, invasive it becomes. 
So, so this notion of trying to clear the mind is, is really uh, um, problematic. Okay, so what is it then? It's about changing our relationship with our thoughts. They, this phrase, inner peace, is, is used a lot, isn't it? It's become almost like a bumper sticker. It's very common, this phrase, inner peace. And I used to think inner peace meant silence. I thought it meant just everything should go away. But actually, my definition of it has changed over the years, which is it's not about an inner silence. It's about being at peace with one's thoughts. So, meditating is not about having an empty mind. That, you, could, you could put yourself into an unconscious state by banging your head against a wall if that's what it is, but it's not. It's not about unconsciousness or trance or disappearing. It's about changing the relationship with the thoughts and emotions, which means to be less driven by them. It means to be able to step back and observe. It's very much about becoming the observer of the thoughts and emotions. In, in Buddhist texts, they use uh, metaphors a lot for this around the, the sky and clouds, a very, very kind of common uh, examples used, which is that the mind is like the sky and our thoughts and emotions are clouds in the sky. And of course, the, the presence of those clouds doesn't um, affect the sky. The sky is bigger than the clouds. In the same way, our mind is bigger than its thoughts and emotions. When we can, become, when we can take the position of observer, being able to see, and just let the, let the clouds go by, or almost like letting traffic go by on a road. Just imagine you're standing at the side of a busy road, and all these cars are going by. Well, trying to stop the traffic just creates a pileup. There'll be a crash. But letting the cars go by, choosing not to get in them, would be a very different experience. And nobody says that's how we should live. I'm not saying we, we, we're supposed to live a life where our thoughts just go by and we never engage in them. It's just an exercise for 15 or 20 minutes a day. But it will change our relationship with our thoughts so that we can be less controlled by what goes on internally. I think we're all far too controlled by our thoughts and emotions. So even though as a, as a culture we fought so hard for external freedom, we, we don't have internal freedom. Because even if we are completely in control of our lives, we're not really in control of our minds, in that our minds often go to places we don't want our mind to go. Anyone who's, who's meditated for five minutes knows that. You know how if you sit down and try to um, focus on your breathing, within about three seconds the, f the plan fails because we start writing shopping lists or um, emails or planning revenge or whatever it is. You know, the mind just goes and it's quite humbling to see how little control we have. So why is that a problem? It's because when we are suffering, our mind is locked into the suffering. When we're distracted, our mind is locked into the distraction. When we're angry, when we're fearful, when we're sad, there's nothing wrong with feeling these things. It's very healthy to feel our emotions, but to be driven by them and to end up saying and doing things based on those emotional reactions that we then regret, that's a problem. And in fact, all of our social problems stem from that one source people not being in control of their minds. So, back to the meditation technique, what is it? Well, it's about learning to step back and not engage so, uh, in such a sticky, obsessive, um, craving way, but that's quite hard. It's hard to just step back. So we need something to hold on to. That's why we use an object in meditation as beginners, we use a focus, so you could use any focus, but the most easy one is your own breathing. There's many others, physical sensation or just the body or the breathing or actually any of the senses. You could use sound, you could use visual objects, you can use any, any focus but one focus. And the whole idea is you're, you're, you're focusing your mind on that. So breathing, for example, you're focusing your mind on your own breathing and then the plan fails, doesn't it? We fail in that the mind wanders. But is it failure? That's the question. Is that failing? 
You see, I think many people see it as failing, and I would question that. So the, the classic situation is somebody sits there meditating, and they're trying to focus on their breathing, and then they realize that they, they go somewhere else. Very interesting how that happens, by the way. It's not that we are focusing on our breathing, and then we see our mind go for a walk and end up somewhere else. It's not like that. It's more that we're focusing on our breathing, and then we kind of blank out, we kind of go a bit unconscious, and then we wake up five minutes later skiing in the Alps, or, or whatever it is. We wake up somewhere else, and then we think, oh, where was I? I'm supposed to be meditating. And that's when we feel we failed, because we lost the meditation. But I would question that. I would question whether that really is failing. I would say, actually, that moment of realizing that you got lost is meditation. You, you are back with the awareness. So it's not a moment of failure, it's a moment of success. And then one brings one's attention back to the breath, gently, just returning to the breath, and then we're off again, and then we bring it back, and then we're off again, not that quickly coming back, usually a long time, and then we come back. But that strengthens us. That strengthens our ability to be less controlled, because what we're doing is every time we generate awareness and then come back to the breath, we are thinning down that mental glue that keeps us locked into those distractions and emotions. We're training ourselves in... Well, if you read Buddhist books, they talk a lot about this phrase, non-attachment, and people think that means you're not allowed to eat chocolate cake or have friends. That's not true. Non-attachment is exactly what I'm talking about here, which is not being so attached to the thoughts and emotions. So actually, a typical meditation session, with the breathing, for example, consists of three parts which are repeated again and again throughout the session. And that's all we have to do is these three things. One part is the part or the phase or the time when we're with the breath. That's the part we all think is the meditation. That's, the, that's what's you know, in the textbook, focus on your breath. So that's one part, the time when we are with the breath. But there are two other parts. The second part is the moment when we realize we got lost. So we were lost in thought, kind of unconscious, and then suddenly we, we, we wake up inside our thoughts. You know that feeling when you suddenly realize, oh, where was I? That's part two. That's also meditation, because you've found your awareness again. You've re-found, regained, you've found the awareness, you're back. So that's part two, phase two. Part three, or phase three, is the coming back to the breath. So... The first part is being with the breath. The second part is realizing you got lost. And the third part is returning. I call these three phases breathing, noticing, and returning. Breathing, noticing, and returning. And a, a meditation session will be made up of those three things again and again. And practicing those three phases makes us stronger over time, just like exercise. But the really interesting thing is that if you realize that it's those three things that you're training in, then you start to have a different relationship with your thoughts and emotions. Because you start to see that the thoughts, distractions, and emotions are the very thing that enable those three things to happen. We look at it this way. If, if you're supposed to be coming back to the breath, well, you've got to have somewhere to come back from. So the distraction enabled you to come back to the breath. So it's not such a bad thing after all. So realizing this revolutionizes people's meditation practice. It no longer needs to be a harsh journey of failure and self-criticism and constant stress, thinking, oh, I keep doing this wrong, I'm not doing it properly. In instead, it becomes very gentle and very accepting. Because when you, your mind wanders and you, you see, oh, you realize, you, you're back, you know, oh, where was I? And you, you, that's not failure, it's a moment of success. You start to have a compassionate um, inner environment. 
our inner landscape is often quite harsh. I know mine used to be incredibly harsh, where I would walk around with this constant inner monologue of self-disgust. And then when I started meditating, my inner landscape was very much about, I'm doing this badly, I've got too many thoughts, I'm rubbish at this, I wish those nasty thoughts would go away. But when we do the practice in the way I've described, which is just noticing and returning, the, the, the atmosphere of our, our psychology becomes quite gentle and quite kind and quite accepting because we're no longer at war with our thoughts and distractions. Our mind got lost, we see it got lost, we don't need to push the thought away, we just bring the attention back to the breath. That is compassion, because we're just leaving the thought in its own natural place and not trying to do anything about it. I would define that as unconditional love, I would describe that as unconditional love. Unconditional love towards a person means to love them just how they are, without wishing to change them in any way whatsoever, just let them be how they are. You love them in that moment, warts and all, in all their glory. So the inner atmosphere of unconditional love in relation to one's own mind is, is about this, in that our mind wanders, we realize it got lost, we notice we were thinking and we just leave that alone. We don't need to chase the thought. We don't need to repress the thought. Just let it be and come back to the breath. So it's a total acceptance. Chasing the thought is a kind of non-acceptance because when we see a thought, or see, you know, perceive a thought, and then we want to make it into two thoughts, we're almost saying this thought isn't good enough the way it is. It needs to be a bit more juicy. It's a little bit boring, let's dress it up, let's jazz it up. Two thoughts, three thoughts, four thoughts, let's take it on a journey. Because in its own essence, it's not good enough, it needs to become more, you know, interesting. So, so chasing the thought is a kind of aggression, because we're saying this thought isn't enough, I need two of them or three of them. Pushing the thought away is also aggression, because we're trying to destroy it. But just to leave it there, and come back to the breath means you're just letting it be. So this changes our interior landscape. It, 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 it starts to develop you into a, a person who's filled with self-acceptance and a kindness towards your own mind, which, of course, then will naturally radiate out. So, so the compassion within will naturally become the compassion um, that radiates towards others and becomes action, of course. Not just a feeling, but action. So I think that's a really crucial learning, which is very, very helpful, is to learn to change one's relationship with one's thoughts. Uh, wh why is it beneficial? Well, it's, obviously it's beneficial because if we do this exercise again and again, we're going to be less controlled by our thoughts and emotions, but also have this gentleness inside which can start to grow and radiate. So compassion is the essence of the meditation journey. And also, uh, of course, Buddhists talk about this a lot, but also in the world of secular mindfulness, um, it, it's so important. People who practice mindfulness, sorry, compassion-based mindfulness, um, find it much more enriching, and it really uh, changes the game. So I would say that compassion-based meditation um, has two, two aspects to it, and I've described one of them so far, which is that the, interior, the, the uh, internal relationship with the thoughts and emotions is compassion, and that grows. But I think another thing is, is to think about why we're meditating. Why are we meditating? It's about intention. It's about um, the motivation... So what I try to do myself and encourage other people to do is every time we sit down to meditate is to take a moment at the start of the session and generate compassion, which doesn't mean sitting there waiting until you feel this kind of overwhelming 
love for all beings, that that's, you can't just kind of manufacture that, but just an intention. Just an intention is a good start. To generate the intention, I am doing this for the benefit of not just myself, but for others too. Through this practice, may I benefit others. And then at the end of the session, close down the session with a sense of dedicating the practice to the benefit of not just oneself, but others too. This means you're framing the practice, you're kind of bookending the session with compassion, intention, building intention. Really exciting research has been done in this, um, particularly by Tanya Singer, the neuroscientist who, who has looked into, uh, used brain scanning, brain imaging on people who practice meditation and especially people who practice compassion-based meditation. And what's been shown is that the motor cortex in the brain has been activated and, and sort of trained or developed. And the motor cortex is the part of the brain that deals with intentions. And if we're literally building the intention again and again and again, and it's activating those brain regions that will make us go out and do things, well, that's a very good thing because our compassion will cease to be just a feeling and become action. And I think the, 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 fusing, the merging together of compassion and meditation is the key, because without that, our ordinary human experience of compassion can be very draining, very draining and very um, a feeling of helplessness. It's more like empathy. Empathy is a good thing. It's a very beautiful quality of the heart. You know, it's, at least we feel something for others. We're not just completely self-centered. We see others suffering and we feel something. That's a good thing, but it's quite frustrating. Uh, there's this notion of empathic distress where you see so much suffering in the world and you feel kind of um, uh, helpless, frustrated, despairing, angry, um, overwhelmed, all of those things. And also uh, the empathy, it, it becomes almost as if, as if we join with the object of our empathy in a state of misery. They are miserable, now I'm miserable too. Again, back to the brain imaging, uh, they've shown that the, when somebody's experiencing empathy, the brain acts almost like a mirror. The part of the brain that... Um, Mirrors. Uh, so if you see somebody in pain, then the pain centers in one's brain start to activate. You feel the pain too. That's why we wince when we see somebody in pain. Somebody's suffering physically, emotionally, and we're kind of feeling it too, just like a mirror, and we become more and more drained, and now two people are suffering. So compassion, you could say, is a sort of upgrade, where... Compassion becomes a trainable skill of the mind that becomes an action of the body. A trainable skill of the mind that becomes an action of the body. In that we're training in the wish and intention to help others. And that's our regular training, as I've described through, through the meditation. But also, what does helping others mean? Yes, of course, it means get out there and feed those who are hungry and help those who are sick, of course. But that's never enough, is it? To really help others, I think we, we want to help them to understand why they suffer and understand how not to suffer, which means to help others to transform their minds, which doesn't necessarily mean going around teaching them meditation. There are many other ways. But it's about... Becoming the kind of person who can understand why and how people suffer and how to change that and helping them to do that. Because then you're getting to the roots of the problem, not just the symptoms. So this is built through daily meditation practice. Daily meditation or mindfulness. I mean, I use the two words interchangeably. Daily meditation practice, building that um, intention to benefit others that then becomes who we are. So there's two things going on. There's building the intention, and there's in the meditation itself that growth of gentle acceptance. Because we can't really be compassionate towards others if, unless we are compassionate towards ourselves. We can't. If we're constantly judging ourselves harshly and, 
uh, criticizing ourselves, that, that, that will project out all the time. So th those two go together, the intention building and the relationship with the thoughts become a compassion practice. Um, so, shall we try it? I think let's really tr make this practical. I'd like to guide you through a seven-step meditation practice, seven steps. Um, so if you want to join in, please join in. Otherwise, have a quick nap. I don't mind. You, you'll look the same, so it doesn't bother me. <laughs> um, but it's quite useful to sit up straight. That does help. So it, it's... It's tempting to slouch in the chair and close one's eyes, but actually it's more focused and alert to be sitting in a good posture. So I would just, you know, sit up straight and have, have a sense of symmetry and balance in the body. Uh, the feet are parallel on the ground, or I've crossed my ankles here because I'm on a lower chair, so whatever feels stable. Your hands can be resting in your lap or palms down on your knees or the tops of your legs. And actually having your eyes open is a very powerful tool, and I'll explain why in a minute. Um, I'll explain why afterwards, but for now just go with me on this. Have your eyes open but not forced open and not looking around the room, but just gently open, which means that they're sort of not focusing on anything. Your, your gaze is sort of lowered slightly but without your face tipping forwards. That's something that happens if you're not careful to keep your head upright, and your gaze is kind of angled downwards into the space in front of you. Blink whenever you need to. Don't hold your eyes open, but just kind of leave them alone, as if you're sitting on the tube and you don't see the face of the person opposite you. Your eyes are open but switched off. Okay, we've just done step one, which was to get in a good posture. Step two is to establish compassion, which means just plant the seed of kindness and compassion by making a deep wish in one's heart, may I benefit others, may I do this practice for the benefit of not just myself but also others. So we are included in that, but may we help others, may this practice give us the strength, the knowledge, the wisdom so that eventually we can help others. Create that train of thinking for a few moments. Okay, step three is be aware of your body. The easiest way to do this is to focus on the contact between your body and the furniture. Feel the chair under your body. Feel the chair through your body, under you, behind you. Just sense it. Sense the contact. Shift your focus now to your hands. Just feel how your hands feel resting on your legs. Notice the sensation of contact between your hands and your clothing as your hands rest on your legs or if you're wearing shorts, then on your skin. Just notice the contact. You're not really thinking about it, you're just feeling it, sensing it. Your mind will keep jumping into thoughts, gently bring it back to the sense. Just gently pull your awareness back into the sensation. Move the attention up to your abdomen. Feel the waistband of your clothing against your waist. Feel how your shirt or your t-shirt just feels against your skin. Okay, the next step, step four, is feel how your body moves with your breathing. 
You don't need to breathe deeply or differently, just normal breathing. But feel how it makes your body contract and expand in a gentle, rhythmical way. Remember that your mind will go, but all you need to do is notice and return. Notice you got lost and return back to the body, feeling the breath moving the body. Okay, now the next step is more precise, more focused, closer to the breath. Focus on how the breath enters and leaves your nose, or if your nose is blocked, then how the breath enters and leaves your mouth. Feel the air brushing against the skin at the edge of your nostrils or your lips. Don't push the air, just let it be. Keep returning to that place when your mind gets lost. Your mind will go into distraction or sleepiness. That's okay, it's all part of bringing you back, back to the breath. Let's try another minute. Okay, now to conclude the exercise, the next step is focus on your body, like we did before. So sense the chair under you, feel your hands, different parts of your body or your body as a whole. Okay, and then the final step is the compassion again. So just a final moment of deciding or committing oneself to the path of compassion. Make the wish in your mind, may I benefit others. Through this practice, may I help myself, but also help others in the deepest possible way.
Okay, stop there. Did you fall asleep? <laughs> Too hot to fall asleep. I've had rooms of people snoring in front of me, so it's quite normal. <laughs> when you're a bit new to this, you can feel really kind of drowsy. Um, if you're new to it, or if you've done it before, but you're not doing it every day, the body sort of just goes into drowsy mode because that's all it knows, either busy or asleep. Those are our two states. <laughs> so uh, if you do this every day, actually the drowsiness wears off and you start to, I mean, you feel more refreshed, you feel more on the, on the ball, on the button, present, uh, focused, aware. Um, so there are many different styles of meditation, but breathing is the most common, and I like to explain it in those different steps because it gives you a kind of warm-up main practice and warm down. And of course, we did a very short five minutes there, but if you did 10 or 15 minutes a day, it's really, uh, really good. Um, but then, the key point is what do you do with it? And, and how, do you, how do you bring that meditation into action, into reality? And how do, you, how do you make it change your day and change who you are? I mean, how does it progress? Just doing 10 minutes a day and then the rest of the day nothing isn't going to do much. But interestingly, even if you just do 10 minutes a day but the rest of the day have tiny little drops or drip feeding it throughout the day, that does make a difference. So here I'm talking about practicing micro moments of mindfulness many times a day, even while you're busy. So it means you could be brushing your teeth, you could be washing your hands, you could be doing simple actions, but bringing your attention into that sense uh, mode. You're, you're sensing the moment, feeling the toothbrush against your teeth, feeling the water or soap against your hands if you're washing your hands. I do this when I'm standing in a queue or waiting somewhere. I'll feel the ground under my feet. I'll be aware of my shoulders, just in small moments. I, I love doing this in busy situations, standing in the queue at an airport or waiting for a train or being in the tube in London, hot, uncomfortable, um, can't get a seat, you're standing there all like sardines. Well, you can take a moment to just feel the, the moment in your body, and this is mindful, it's a mindful moment. But if you're building that throughout your day, I feel it's almost like drip feeding it throughout the day so that it, it just becomes part of you, and it means that your meditation enters your life. It isn't something separate from your life. I was very guilty of this when I started. I, used, I, I got to the state in, uh, in my early days of being a monk of doing two solid hours of meditation a day and thinking, yeah, I'm really, you know, top of the class doing it properly. But no, it was not working at all because the rest of the day I was just not bringing it into reality. So it was wasted. I was quite arrogant about the whole thing, thinking, yes, two hours. But it's not about counting the hours you've done and then giving yourself a gold medal. It's about making it part of your life. So it was actually only after a few years of being a monk that I discovered how to do those mindful moments. And then that changed things. It really helped me to become much more calm. I, I used to be a very highly strung, anxious, speedy, quite manic person. And my body chemistry has changed. I'm much more grounded and much more calm and relaxed as a result of simply doing these moments throughout the day and letting that become part of my system. Um, but there's a deeper reason for it. It's also about learning to enjoy the present moment, especially when it's a moment of discomfort. So when I, when I teach people this, I often start them off with simple things, such as brush your teeth mindfully, wash your hands mindfully, drink tea mindfully, uh, have little moments behind your desk where you feel the ground under your feet. But then I try to encourage them after a while to start deliberately going into a mindful state when they're stuck in traffic, or when they're standing in a queue, or whenever they feel themselves to be impatient, waiting for something. Waiting is a really interesting phenomenon. It's something we do many times a day and it's something we generally don't like because the notion of waiting means that you're not living, you're waiting for the thing to happen that then you'll live. And that seems to be our lives. 
that we're always waiting for the next thing. So when is the next thing? Because the next thing will then be waiting for the next next thing. So in those waiting moments, which are, uh, there's multiple of moments like that each day, waiting for something, in those moments we generally start uh, going into a slightly stressy state. The body starts producing cortisol, adrenaline, we go into that sort of stuck state um, or, or feeling of rushing or wanting to move forward. If you practice a moment of mindful awareness in that moment, so you're sitting behind the wheel of your car, you're in traffic, and you just really sense the chair under you, the car seat, or you're waiting for a train or standing in a queue, and you really sense the ground under your feet. If you do that, you are kind of reprogramming yourself because you're learning how to meet discomfort with acceptance and awareness, which is a form of compassion, because you're learning to forgive that moment. But also, you're learning how, you're teaching yourself how to be happy against the odds. How to be happy against the odds. Because normally our relationship with happiness tends to be about, I need to be in the right situation and then I will be happy. I need to lie on a beach. I need to be having a bath with bath salts and candles and music. I need, I need a situation that makes me happy. That's the normal approach to happiness. But if you take this as your exercise, what I've mentioned, then next time you're stuck in traffic, instead of feeling unhappy, you'll, you're, you'll feel a kind of little energy in you of, oh, I can do that thing. I can do that thing I learned about. I'm going to do, I'm going to do my practice. So you're in a situation that would normally make you emotionally shut down and physically start to feel stressed, but instead you're thinking, bring it on. This is helping me to go deeper. It's a bit like going to the gym and lifting weights. You're not going to lift feathers, you won't get muscle. You're going to lift big weights, you'll get big muscle. So you need the resistance to give you strength in a gym. It's kind of like that with this exercise, that you're standing in a queue or stuck in traffic and you're relaxing into the moment. So you start to feel a sense of curious enthusiasm around the things that normally wind you up. So this starts to develop as what I would call independent happiness. Independent happiness. Happiness that doesn't depend on a trigger. Happiness that you can produce within yourself even in difficult situations. And of course you start with cues and traffic jams, but it can become your habit that then builds into um, more difficult situations. I mean, for me, uh, I used to always be terrified of any kind of public speaking. Um, that was, for me, the most horrible, horrific thing ever. Um, I was an actor before, but that's very different. Being an actor is easy because you're not being yourself. You're, just, you're being completely somebody different, so you can disappear behind that. But any time I had to present at college, I had to do that a bit, present to a group, I would, I would just start crying with fear. And in my early days of being a monk, when I had to give little lectures at the monastery, I'd be terrified. And what I started to learn to do was take that moment, at in, do mindfulness in that moment. So as I'm, as I'm standing on a stage talking, I'll go into a mindful state. So I'm meeting the thing that normally is uncomfortable in a mindful way. And what that's done for me is, for me now, giving a talk is like having a massage. It's like relaxing for my body. Towards the end, I feel really kind of, you know, the more I do it, the more, more, I, more relaxed I become because I've made a connection in my mind between scary thing, relaxed response. Put those together. So how can this start to build? Well, it could build into our relationships. Relationships with people at home or at work where we feel uh, tense, unhappy. These kind of exercises create forgiveness. Forgiveness is, a, again, a trainable skill. It's where you can teach yourself to go into a more calm, more relaxed, more present state in the face of somebody, or when you think about somebody or you're with somebody who normally winds you up. It doesn't make you into a doormat. It actually makes you stronger. So this is the final topic I wanted to mention tonight, and then we're going to 
deal with questions, and then we're going to finish. So I want to say a few things about forgiveness, and I've introduced the topic by um, talking about this very uh, practical tool around relaxing in queues and traffic jams, and believe it or not, that changes our relationships because it trains you in being able to meet the thing that normally winds you up and meet it with peace and almost enthusiasm. It doesn't turn you into a masochist, don't worry. It just, just makes you a little bit more open to the things that normally make you tense. But I think forgiveness as a trainable skill is very much about two things. One is that just by meditating regularly, just the meditation alone, even a simple meditation such as what we did with the breathing, just that alone has a very powerful effect on training in forgiveness because what is it that makes us unable to forgive is how much our mind is um, tormented by hurt and anger and resentment. So even though something happened with somebody either five minutes ago or five years ago, what's happening right now is my mind is locked into a hurt, a wound, an anger, a resentment, whatever the feeling is. It's locked in and it doesn't know how to unlock itself. We don't want to walk around feeling angry or hurt, but here we are feeling angry and hurt. So meditation obviously is going to loosen up that locked state because through doing the daily meditation practice, we are learning to be um, less attached to our thoughts and emotions. That glue that I talked about before. So when you're doing meditation, you may not be directly addressing the hurt that you feel. It might be that you're just sitting there meditating and the mind starts planning menus or thinking what to have for dinner, but that's the chance to then come back to the breath, which means you're weakening the attachment your mind has to its thoughts. So this will have a profound effect on our relationship with hurt and resentment because we are training in being able to... I don't really like the phrase, let go. It's more about just leave it alone and not be bothered by it. Let it be. Do you see how that works? It's a, it's a, it's a training in not being so controlled by mental um, habits. So I said there were two things, two, two major steps in forgiveness training. One is that, just meditating anyway will help, but the other thing is through reflection, through what in Buddhism we call analytical meditation, which is to think constructively about something. So meditation isn't always about not thinking. It's not always about the breath or letting go. It's about sometimes analyzing or reflecting uh, on a subject, a topic. The topic being this person who winds you up. Uh, this person who hurts you or has hurt you or whatever it is. Somebody you know or don't know, somebody you resent. And it's around starting to understand the human condition from a deeper perspective. It's about recognizing that the human being is over-controlled by one's thoughts and emotions, and this is how we are, and this is how everybody else is. So that person who has said or done the thing that we find so uh, difficult to deal with wasn't really out to get us, even if it seemed as if they were. It wasn't a deliberate planned thing, even if it seemed like it was, they are consumed by their own stress, their own suffering, their own ignorance, their own negativity, their own mental darkness that is a product of everything they've been through in their life. We don't know what happened to them that brought them to this place, but something will have happened. And in this moment, they are behaving towards us in a way that's not they're almost out of control because they're, they're being driven by negative impulses in their mind. It doesn't excuse or condone what they do, but it helps us to understand it. And to maybe even see how there is a part of ourself that does the same. This, for me, was a very uh, uh, important part of my four-year retreat. I spent a lot of time 
in the retreat at night. Um, I would turn the lights off after the daily program was over. I would turn the lights off and I would do, um, I would sit and do um, some compassion work around my relationship with my father. We've always had a very difficult relationship and I've always felt very um, uh, damaged and abused by him and all of that. And what, what I was doing in these meditations was I would sit there and I would think about him, I would imagine him opposite myself, and I would try to feel that I was breathing in all his sadness and all his suffering, breathing it into myself and exchanging it for love, sending out rays of white light into him and filling him with peace, breathing in his pain, breathing out joy, and trying to, t trying to sort of feel that I was taking away his pain. And what was very interesting to me was I was then reflecting on his so-called darkness, all the things he did or said that were so cold or aggressive or, and hurtful. I'm thinking about those while I'm breathing them in. And then suddenly one evening I thought, and I, it wasn't just a thought, it was a feeling. I suddenly thought and felt, oh, I do that too. I do what he does. And I suddenly realized that when I'm frightened, I become quite cold. When I'm nervous or frightened, I tend to block people out. I tend to, I become scared and I, 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 I lose my gentleness and I become quite, and they might feel rejected. I'm not trying to reject them, but they probably do. I hope I don't do this so much now, but I definitely used to a lot. And it was really, really a moment when I thought, oh, the, the enemy, my father, the so-called enemy, is in me. And what I'm finding so abhorrent in him is the very thing in myself that I, I, know, I now know I do and I don't like about myself. So this is the, the two-way street of compassion, is forgiving them and forgiving yourself. So I just wanted to leave you with that thought at the end of this talk, and I hope... Um, some of what I've said has been useful and practical for you, and thank you very much. So, if any of you have questions, we have time now, and there are some microphones uh, roaming around. Our friends in green are holding microphones. So, hello. Hi, um, thank you for that. I don't know about anybody else, but I really needed that this week. Um, it, was, it was really, I feel calmer, I feel relaxed, um, and with some things to go home with. Um, one of the things that I wanted to ask um, was about the uh, distinction between meditation and mindfulness, if there is a distinction. So I think probably in my sort of basic understanding, um, I, I kind of understood what you meant by sort of when we meditate and the, the sort of cloud metaphor, your thoughts are going and eventually like a sieve, they'll just start to settle and you'll get more clarity and be sort of more peaceful inside. And then mindfulness I always thought was really just being in the moment of what you're doing. So whether you're washing up or you're driving a car, but not necessarily sort of looking at these thoughts um, coming and going, they might achieve the same outcome. But I, I, I think in my mind, I'm not sure if there is a distinction. It feels like there is, but you've interchanged the, the, the two throughout it's the talk. A, it's a very complex discussion because nowadays some people do separate them and there's this... Uh, obviously very popular modern movement around mindfulness, which in some ways is a kind of rebrand. It's a more, for, for many people, it's a more neutral term. Maybe the word meditation has, to many people, suggested Eastern philosophy, Buddhism, too much, and so a clean slate would be to call it mindfulness. The technique is the same. I mean, if you have somebody sitting watching their breath and saying they're doing meditation and somebody next to them are doing mindfulness. Are they watching their breath in a different way? No. So in many ways it's the same thing and I tend to use the two words interchangeably. But if you want to get really technical, um, there are many ways of defining mindfulness and one of them is that it's the thing you do in meditation when you, to bring yourself back to the moment. It's the action of returning the, the action of bringing your attention back into the moment is, is the 
action, the work of mindfulness, and it also refers to those moments in daily life, which I talked about before, the micro moments. But it's very, it's very complex, these definitions. The, forget it, just do it, you know? It's just about doing it, and don't worry what you're calling it, but do it. Yeah, great, thank, thank you. Thank you. Who's next? Anyone who's near a microphone, just go for it. There's a gentleman at the front, hi. Okay, we'll come to you in a minute. Hello there. Hello Hi. there. I wonder if you see a difference between um, non-striving and um, kind of having dreams and having goals. Um, yeah, this it's is something yeah, I'm kind yeah. of confused about. This is always a, this is a question that comes up regularly, so it's obviously an important one, which is. In, in the world of meditation and mindfulness and Buddhism, we talk about you know, not striving and, not, not, and just accepting and letting go. And then would you just become like a kind of um, just nothing, nothing to, nothing to achieve or nothing to attain? Well, actually, it's more about what you're doing in the meditation session. In the meditation session, there's a funny combination of goal and no goal. The goal part is that we are starting our session with that moment of, I want to benefit others. So that's a sense of goal, isn't it? But then you let go of that, and the meditation itself is, I'm not, gonna, I'm not striving for a particular outcome or experience or feeling. Just let it be however it is. Total acceptance of what it is. That's not going to take away our um, ambition in life or our sense of purpose it might, in fact, clarify our purpose. Because I think many people have very messy purpose. Not actually sure what they want, but they're still striving for something. So I think the more you meditate, the more your, your mind becomes more um, refined and clear about what you want and whether it's actually what you need and whether it's actually something that will benefit you and others. So people who meditate a lot tend to become quite precise about what they think is important in life and they tend to be more motivated by compassion, and they can strive a lot. I have friends who meditate a lot, and they're very busy starting charities, helping people, serving the world in whatever way they can. So there is a, maybe striving is a bit of a harsh term, but sort of there's an there's a energy of aspiration and action. Does that help? It does a lot. Thank, Thank you. you. Who's next? Hello. I'm Hi. here. Where are you? On the other side of the room. Hello. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> I liked how you described massaging regular meditation into yourself. And I liked how you described the three stages and where when you bring yourself back, you waken up, as it were, in your own bed. Um, but could you unpick a little bit if there's a difference between thoughts and emotions? You speak of thoughts and feelings and emotions. Is it simply a matter of degree, the difference yeah. between them? Or can you say something about that, please? I think emotions... Well, in, in, in Buddhist texts uh, about the mind, they, 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 they talk about mental activity as a huge, um, a, a huge range of experiences, thoughts, emotions, distractions, memories, anything, actually. In fact, in the deeper aspect of Buddhist philosophy, they say that the entire universe is mental activity because we're perceiving it with our mind. So it gets quite um, uh, complex. But, but I, I, when I talk, when I, whenever I'm uh, teaching about meditation, I'm, I'm thinking in terms of mental activity and I would say thoughts and emotions are just all within that category. Emotions are maybe thoughts which have more... Um, more charge, and the stronger thought, thoughts which have more, more um, thoughts which shout louder, or thoughts which last longer, or thoughts which become a mood that... Emotions are very useful because you can feel them quite strongly in your body, and that's what I was doing in retreat where I was feeling this horrible sadness and um, anxiety and locating it physically and then learning to give compassion to that physical feeling was... I was quite glad I was having emotional states that were so juicy and so strong. Um, so I would say that emotions can be very useful in that sense. Okay? Okay, good. Thank you. 
Anything else? Who's next? You've been you've been had your hand up for a long time, so definitely coming to you next after this person. Oh, sorry. Hi. Hi. How would you describe a difference between feeling compassion towards oneself and uh, feeling uh, uh, sorry for oneself? How would you define them? I don't know. When you say feeling sorry for yourself, do you see that as a bad thing, as a good thing? What, what, what's your, what do you mean by that? Do you mean... Well, it's, uh, it's kind of... Uh, it, it's, it's rather miserable. Uh, it's a miserable feeling to feel sorry for oneself. But do you mean when one gets it... Yeah, yeah, do you mean that one, you, you're kind of going around feeling poor me and you're just sort of... Yes. Almost uh, just stuck in that. Yes. Well, I would say compassion for oneself is about a very direct loving relationship with one's thoughts and emotions, particularly the ones that hurt. So, it's, so, so you're having a very direct sense of kindness and acceptance towards those parts of your mind that you normally would want to get rid of. So that's quite dynamic. You're not s sort of sloshing around in the misery feeling, poor me. You're, you're really dynamically training to make friends with that part of you that you weren't friends with. Thank you. Uh, can we pass the mic just over to the front here? Yeah, thank you. Um, well, first of all, thank you for sharing your story and knowledge. Thank uh, you. I think I have a little bit different question from, from the rest, which is just curious. I have actually two sets of questions. Okay. Based on your experience. So first, yeah. To enter the monastery, yeah. do you have to wear robes and shave your hand? Uh, depends it, if you're going to be a monk or not. My if you want to be, okay, if you want to be a monk. Yeah, unfortunately it's the uniform. You have to. <laughs> <laughs> Let me make one thing clear though. Buddhism and also the whole world of meditation and mindfulness, you don't have to be a monk. Monks are... Very, a very specific role within Buddhism. Many people practice Buddhism and have ordinary lives with families and jobs and all of that. Monks are a, just a very specific tradition within Buddhism. To be a monk, you have to do all this stuff. Okay, no, I understand that. And then, so you've given a vow, so you're still a monk. Sorry? You've given a vow, so you promise to be a monk. Yeah, so you I take a vow... Uh, okay. for your whole life, wow, and you, you English, follow, you follow <laughs> rules. There, there are 253 vows. Wow, okay. And uh, you, you keep them. Fine. So mm. now, the question is then, based on what you've just told me, um, how does this vows, vows, right? Vows? Vows, sorry. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. Now I know this. Yeah. Uh, how do these vows and, um, you know, the way you have to look serves you to bring this knowledge to people? Well, it's a choice, so I'm not saying everyone should do it. No, of course not. But for me personally, um, it, take, keeping these vows has given me the freedom to serve others. Okay. Because I'm quite an intense, obsessive person. Mm -hmm. So if I'm going to have a relationship and a family, I'll be, I'll be very obsessive about that, and to the exclusion of everything else. So with my kind of mind, I, I feel a life of celibacy and n not working in the normal way that other people work and having cars and houses and families. I feel that giving up all of that has opened me up to being able to serve others, and it's made me incredibly happy. It's not a restrictive life of abstinence. I have a great time. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, you know, I, I, I believe this, but um, at the same time, it makes me think that, uh, you know, when you have rules, they, they help, uh, but isn't that, you know, very simple comparison? If you, like, learn to, learn to ride a bicycle, mm -hmm. and first, you know, you're really bad at that, mm -hmm. uh, and you, you have this, like, you know, third wheel kind of oh, thing, yeah. and you, you get better in that, you know, and maybe you have four wheels, and then, you know, you put one off and you have three and then you have, you know, and you're even better than that, you're even more confident and then you put all of them and you just write. So now being constrained by some rules which you believe in will help you. Oh, but you're suggesting constraint. 
I'm uh, suggesting there isn't a constraint. There's a, a um, clarifying of focus. Okay, but why do you need to wear, you know, robes to, to because have... Because I want to. I don't you need, want to. I okay. don't need to, but I want to. All right. Okay. I understand. So this is first, the first one. Uh, <laughs> Um, sorry, I mean, I've, if, if you know if I took a lot of time, just stop me and just take the mic off me. Just that, go that for it. Fine. <laughs> so the second one, you know, you're coming from the west to the east to learn Buddhism. Well, no, I went to Scotland. <laughs> My oh. monastery is in Scotland. All oh, right, your monastery in Scotland. Mm. Still, doesn't matter. It's uh, you know, it's coming from the east in terms mm. of you know origins, right? Mm. So now um, there is like a big conception that Western world is all about more about science and knowledge mm -hmm. and you know logically you think through and you know a lot of scientists Albert Einstein, Stephen Hawking and mm -hmm. all these famous people mm -hmm. uh, usually come from Western culture mm -hmm. and at the same time Eastern more perceived like wisdom. You're on the clock by the way so let's speed this one up. <laughs> all right I think that's I think that's so and the, as a side like you know there is a wisdom in um, in the East yeah. but and we can see a lot of Chinese people, if they want to learn science, they go to West, like U.S. and everything. But a lot of West people, if they want to learn a little bit of wisdom, they try to go East. But is it that, have you seen these dynamics, or have you noticed that at the end, it's all about the same? Well, to me, Buddhism is a science. It's the science of awareness. I'm not so interested in rockets and, and microscopes. I'm interested in exploring consciousness. And the reason I love Buddhism is because it is incredibly scientific. It's not a religion or a belief system. It's a tool for examining what is the mind. So that, to me, is pure science. Okay? okay thanks. Yeah. Thank we're, you. We're on the clock. I think we need to stop. I think that's it. Oh. Okay. It's up, it's up to you. Okay. Hi. Okay. Hello. Oh, that's loud. Hello. Um, yeah, I guess I'd like to say thanks as well as some of the other people have said, just because so, many, so much of what you've been saying has really struck a chord with me. Um, Thank you. I've been scribbling away um, at all of the things that have uh, been meaningful for me, and I've got pages here. Great. Um, so thank you. Can I borrow them for my next book? <laughs> <laughs> Feel free, yeah. Um, I think the main thing that's really struck me was um, your... Uh, view of what compassion is because mm. I think I've been I realise I've been kind of beating my head against the wall in terms of considering compassion as a feeling that I have to have of warmth, of positivity right. towards myself Right. so whenever I come up against something that I don't like about myself I think to myself I must feel warm about myself, I must feel right. positive. As soon as you say must you've You've got the compassions out the window. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. Um, so I think you saying leaving it alone mm. and just allowing it to be has really been uh, a, a click in my mind. I think mm. that's made an awful lot of sense. Great. Um, so Job thank, done. Thank you very much. Um, Job done. I can go home now. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I, I guess I'm, I'm kind of not 100% sure what the question is, to be honest, but um, <laughs> like uh, I, uh, I, think the, um, I think one of the fears that I have is that if I just leave it be and I don't try and fix it, yeah. then the problem will go unsolved and I will continue living with this, this problem. Sure. Um, so yeah. it, it, there's that fear there that stops me from just letting it go and leaving it be. But isn't it about learning to solve a problem from a higher level of consciousness than the one that is, the problem belongs to? Isn't it? So it's about being able to step back, leave the problem alone, step back, be like the sky, and from that spacious awareness, the wisdom that's inherent in our mind, that's our natural state, will start to uh, give us good ideas. I think it's probably like that, but I'm not sure. Okay. <laughs> In fact, I'm not sure about anything I've said tonight. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you 
so much for being here this evening. I, I found that incredibly helpful and for especially moving at the end with that, that focus on forgiveness. I thought what you shared about your relationship with your father was really moving. I was reminded of a quote that often stays with me, which is something along the lines of the people who are in need of the most love show it in the, the least loving of ways. And there's something about if we can actually empathize with the anxiety and trauma that others experience that helps us understand their behavior more. So I'm very grateful for you sharing all of what you've shared this evening. Folks, do take a chance to check out um, Tipton's wonderful book and there's more you can find out about his work and thinking online. We'll send, as we always do, a follow-up email to people afterwards and that will have some links back to where you can uh, find out more. Um, just before we show our thanks one more time, just to let you know that we're now taking a break from these events. They're normally monthly. We're going to have a sort of a break in August, so I hope you all have a, a lovely um, summer break. Um, our next event is actually sort of very much building on this theme with another very wise um, Buddhist-inspired uh, thinker, Mathieu Ricard, who many of you will be um, familiar with. So Mathieu will be with us in September on Thursday the 5th back in this same room, so we'll share details about that as well, and really building on the, the, the wonderful ideas of compassion and, and mindfulness that we've been talking about this evening. So um, just finally, if you could, and there's also details of a wonderful um, compassion workshop by another friend of ours, um, uh, Jimper, who's going to be in the UK as a rare visit in September. So if you'd like to take one of those leaflets away, please feel free to. But if not, if you could bring any spare leaflets to the back and indeed any sort of rubbish from this evening, cups, banana skins, whatever, we really help our team to sort of clear those away. So all it remains for me to say is have a wonderful summer. Thank you for all your support. And please join me in giving Tubton one more thank, big thank you for this evening. Lovely.